15. Hello there. Um, on my way here, I was contacted by a woman who purported to be a representative of the Mus Russian media. Um, I don't know whether her bank account has just been frozen or anything. But um, her question was simple and blunt. It was, was Sir Stephen Runciman homosexual? And I would, um, I would very much like to have replied with this picture. Um. <laughs> and what I think this picture fairly clearly reveals is that the most important value to Stephen Runciman was not, say, literal fact, not even historical truth, but glamour. And by the word glamour, I don't simply mean physical beauty or even personal charisma. I mean something a bit weirder in the etymological sense of that word, a little more magical and Scottish, a little bit more fairy, um, glamoury, the state of magic where one becomes more vivid but less visible. And I think that really sums up um, the essence of Stephen Runciman. Um, he was born in 1903 into a political liberal family. He grew up comfortably between Northumberland and Westminster, um, but very conscious of Scottishness. Um, he was educated at Eton, where the history curriculum was at the time both patchy and parochial. A near contemporary of his described uh, the school's attitudes to the Crusades as being extraordinarily vague. We heard of them slightly because a couple of English princes had got involved. <laughs> and yet, for all that, um, Stephen, as an uh, old man, w would um, come to make this subject very much his own. And subsequently, of course, it has become a subject that belongs to all of us with increasing resonance. Um, here we see Stephen about to settle down to write his Crusades trilogy on the island of Egg, which his family had purchased, um, a Hebridean island, in the, a small island um, quite far north, um, in the mid-1920s. Um, he's in a lodge that's designed to look like an Italianate villa, and as such, it's a rare sight in those, that part of the world. <laughs> um, um, this represented his place of seclusion after an, a bizarre, peculiar, mobile war, which his correspondence reveals um, was mainly his running concern about his furniture. He's constantly being reposted from Sofia to J Jerusalem to Istanbul, and he's saying, can I be bothered to accept this extremely lucrative and distinguished new position? I'll, I'll almost certainly lose all my finest um, Palestinian armchairs and you know, that sort of thing. And, and what I have recently come to wonder, this isn't in my book, by the way, is if this is a bit of um, unfound evidence about his intelligence career. Could armchairs mean, say, um, at-at guns or, or something? Um, um, we'll come back to that. But... Um, when he um, devoted himself to the Crusades and when the trilogy emerged book by book, um, it was a se series of books suffused with his time and place, with the sense of being in a cash-strapped, weary, pyrrhically victorious Britain post-war. Um, his description of the Byzantine Empire fairly clearly refers, I think, to another empire. Um, it goes like this. All over the empire, there had fallen that atmosphere of lassitude and pessimism that so often, after a long, bitter war, assails the victors, no less than the defeated. Um, for him, the Crusades were a forceful moral parable. Uh, they were an opportunity to describe um, old-fashioned, fading, uh, liberal civilization under threat from dangerous, fanatical, totalitarian forces of religious or political or, um, or simply the forces of personal ambition. Uh, for him, the Crusaders were ambitious barbarians invading an infinitely more distinguished, older heritage. Um, and this is w very much what he'd seen before, during, and after the war with friends uh, passing uh, through sort of an aesthetic, jolly, bright young thing period to a more totalitarian Iron Age. And um, with... Uh, during and after the war, he had seen countries he loved, Turkey and Greece notably, um, suffering, um, also Palestine suffering, uh, growing less and less complicated, less and less multivalent, and more and more metallic and driven by war and division. Um, his Crusades was a sermon um, against iron curtains, um, against um, meaningless conflict, 
and um, an attempt to introduce us to a more interlocked way of um, appreciating the world and its many beauties and amusements. It, um, his crusades were, I think, um, successful because of their affinity with fictional technique. Um, they have more in common in some ways with novels after the war. I'm thinking Evelyn War, Anthony Pohl, Olivia Manning, and even the great Arthurian fantasist T.H. White. All of these wrote um, novels shaped by the war, published after the war, um, which related very much to how they were feeling as a result of the war. Um, and Stephen is very much within that genre. And I think it's the fictional force of the Crusades, the psychological motivations, the narrative thrusts, the very coherent characterization that enables th those three books to linger um, as the dominant uh, coverage of their subject in the mind of the, ge in the, mind of the general reader, um, despite the fury and the envy of almost every professional historian who has come after them. Um, Stephen's career did not begin with the Crusades, however. Um, as a young historian, um, he underwent a period of tutelage with a very eccentric and great Irish Byzantinist called J.B. Bury, who, though very unwilling to accept any pupils in his retirement, was forced to accept Runciman because he was the only young man around who spoke Bulgarian. <laughs> and so it was to Bulgaria that Stephen went. Here we see him in Varna by the Black Sea, um, taking an afternoon with the most sort of Anglophone courtier Bulgarian family, rather a small Venn diagram, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and um, he got to know a number of um, people and curious adventures in Bulgaria, um, up to and including the king, Boris III, um, a, a rather mercurial, interesting character, not without ability, um, but um, unstable and prone to sudden moods, um, who would prove a very... Um, unhelpful uh, co cooperator with the Allies in the Second World War. Um, it seems that the beginning of Stephen's war career um, was, his, um, uh, was dis him being dispatched to the aid um, of Britain to lobby um, King Boris secretly for the Allied cause. And he was dispatched um, by his most notorious pupil. This is Guy Burgess, um, who would uh, later go on to many kinds of twilight fame in 1930, Stephen wrote to his sister that um, Guy Burgess was the undergraduate who I find most in intelligent and sympathetic at the moment, though his teeth are too far apart. <laughs> this is a number of many, many shadowy, amusingly imprecise frustrations where Stephen seems to hint that something might or might not have happened. Um, often he denies any physical connection with with Burgess in ways that sound like a, 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 a confession. Um, you know, I would never have gone for that. Um, he, I was too tall for him, that sort of thing. Um, 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 but um, essentially, his connection, his emotional connection with Burgess was real, and he recognized in Burgess an exceptionally sensitive and persuasive historical thinker. He never forgave Burgess's friends, John Cornford and Anthony Blunt, for turning Burgess away from historical study and towards far left politics. In a sense, for Runciman, Burgess would be um, someone misled into a, into a mad crusade who should have been a civilized, cultivated person, um, a classic example of that kind. Um, Burgess himself seems to have both sent Runciman on the Bulgarian mission and subsequently briefed against him and called him an incompetent um, in a very characteristic piece of two-faced Burgess behavior. And Runciman was almost killed on the mission by a, a mysterious bomb on a diplomatic tr train either placed there by the Germans, the Bulgarians, or possibly, so said the Germans, and so said the Bulgarians, and who knows, they may have been right, the bungling British themselves. Um, after the war, Runciman continued um, to do the unexpected. <laughs> here, here we see him um, in Sydney Zoo, not long after his knighthood in 1958, um, a process which he lamented as making him at last both middle-aged and middle-class. Um, he is enjoying the company of a koala bear, and this particular bear was said to be the only untamed bear in Sydney Zoo until Stephen, Sir Stephen, began to whisper to it. Um, <laughs> not long afterwards, the largest uh, buck kangaroo in the zoo approached him, and he claims to have been narrowly saved from death or worse. Perhaps he wouldn't have minded death or worse unduly, um, as he says elsewhere that he possessed 
the temperament of a harlot. Um, I'm going to finish um, with some examples of Runciman's exceptional prose, which is really the point about him. Um, after the war and after the Crusades, his prose was particularly under control in shorter, taught, highly saleable books. In the case of the fall of Constantinople, he was outsold only by John Lennon's prose poetry. Um, uh, the Sicilian Vespers, my favorite, um, contains uh, a, a very useful dictum, which is that um, a historical canvas is by necessity crowded, and readers afraid of crowds should stick to the better, better ordered paths of fiction. But perhaps his most elegiac and aesthetic writing comes in the fall of Constantinople in 1965. Um, for example, here is a description of the city which had by this moment degenerated practically into the country. In many districts, you would have thought that you were in the open countryside with wild roses blooming and the hedgerows in spring and nightingales singing in the copses. And here is a description of the force of divine protection of the Lord and the Virgin Mary abandoning the city as it was about to fall. The whole city was blotted out by a thick fog, a phenomenon unknown in those lands in the month of May. The divine presence was veiling itself in cloud to conceal its departure from the city. It was noticed that a strange light played about the dome of the great church. Lights too could be seen glimmering in the distant countryside. Now, Runciman clearly has in his head at this moment um, a, a scene from Shakespeare where the defeated Mark Antony is abandoned by the god Hercules um, and he is a strange music. His soldiers hear the music as the god abandons him. And this, this moment was also taken up by one of Runciman's favorite Greek poets, Constantine Cavafy, who describes the exquisite music of that strange procession. Um, a line which, incidentally, was run with by none other than Leonard Cohen in a song called Alexandra Leaving. Um, Runciman uh, is, all I'm saying, keys into a uniquely wistful um, and elegiac form of beauty. Um, he is happy to represent relictum and the past to appear to be conveying the values and the beauties of a previous order. Um, he would accept that he is no longer of our, our world, that he does not belong. His ghost would accept that it does not belong to what has happened since him, to September the 11th, um, to the war in Syria, which wiped out so many complexities of the kind he would have loved, to the rhetoric of the Crusades being abused by neoconservatives and, of course, by Islamist fanatics as well. Um, these are all things he was lucky not to see. Um, and yet, um, these are things, ways, in which we can continue to learn from him and also, on a lighter note, be enlivened and delighted by him. Thank you.